So we've been looking at the first three soils, and now we come to the fourth soil. So the first three, we've seen very clearly, do not describe true salvation. Each of these previous soils falls short in at least one area, in an area that is essential in having saving faith. So as we go through this last soil, we'll refer back to these three soils and compare them and compare them in a way of of seeing where they fall short compared to this fourth soil. So this fourth soil is the only soil here in the parable that describes true salvation, true conversion. And so we need to come to this, as I said, with intentions that we're looking in a mirror, asking honest questions. So this will be our structure today. Our structure will be looking at the three different elements that make up saving faith. And in doing so, we'll also look at a practical outworking of the main element, the the third element, and see how this is lived out in this specific way that is uh, addressed in this parable. So if you have the bulletin, follow along, take notes. Um, I encourage you to do that and then do further study. Uh, It's important to note that all three of these elements of saving faith must be present in order for salvation to truly exist. All of them. So that's where we need to examine our hearts, examine ourselves, where we truly are today. So these three elements are this. Number one, truth. Number two, agreement. Number three, trust. Truth, agreement, trust. Now, before we get started in looking at these elements, I want to define these elements for you, what they are, what we're talking about here. So truth obviously refers to the gospel message itself. The doctrine and the gospel message contains the truth that's proclaimed. Okay, it's this, this is the truth that is to be believed. So truth, easy, right, clear. Second, agreement. This refers to a belief or an agreement from the individual regarding the truth that they heard. The truth that was explained to them. They agree with the doctrine, the teaching. It is believing that the content that they heard is true. Saying, yes, I agree with that. The third element is trust. This refers to the trust that the individual puts into that truth that they agree with. So they entrust their entire self, their entire life upon that truth, which is ultimately Jesus because he is the embodiment of the truth. He is the gospel himself that came to flesh. So this person, in a very real way, rests all of their weight on the truth, the gospel in Jesus. It's like betting down everything, every single thing you have upon that truth. You're all in. Everything rides on it. Everything. It's risking all that you have on the truth of that truth. Risking all that you have. It's like if you could package up everything that pertains to you, no matter what it is, whether it's life, health, family, possessions, jobs, everything, and then give it over to that truth in a complete release saying, it's not mine anymore, it's yours. I put all of my weight, all of who I am upon that truth because I trust that that truth is true. So that is a picture of this trust. And with this element, there will be a certain way in which this trust shows itself in this parable. And it's not the only way that shows this trust in saving faith, but it's, it's one way. There are many different ways that flesh this out in Scripture. But this is what we're going to be looking at in the context today that shows itself in the Christian life. And so these are the three elements of saving faith. Now, in order for us to see these elements in the right light, we must notice what comes before the existence of these three elements. The elements that are living together in saving faith. So here we're talking about the good soil, the quote-unquote good soil. 
Notice how Luke describes this good soil in more detail by saying that the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart. And with this added detail, the picture becomes more clear of what comes before saving faith. What is existing before all the action happens? We've talked about this before. This is a picture of the necessity of being born again. The regeneration that must come before anything else happens in the actual salvation of a soul. The new heart, the good heart has to be there and it has to be first unless, and if it's not there, we can't see and know the things of God. We can't enter the kingdom of God. So this has to be here. So without the new heart coming first, we put righteous action before we are given a new heart. When we do this, talked about this before, we destroy the one true religion of grace, don't we? If we put any action that God accepts before the good heart, then we have no need for a good heart. Because we already have one that does good things for God. So we need to see these, this order of things that are happening in Scripture that are clear as we slow down and focus on what's going on. This person already has a noble and good heart. This noble and good heart describes a heart that is worthy, that is excellent in its nature, in its essence. And its tendencies. So we are, if we put the implication that faith comes before being born again, that should raise enormous red flags for us that that is completely false. And so we know this. We've talked about this. We need to know. We need to know it firmly and believe it that the good heart has to come first, before anything in salvation happens. This is the work of God alone. And so the, the three saving elements, let's look at these. The first is truth. So this, as I said before, is the element that is all about the truth. And these are, this is present in all of the soils. This is the gospel message itself, the message of the kingdom If the content is there, and that's the only thing there, as we see in the first soil, then that's just part one. But if it's just part one that exists, then saving faith does not exist. You can hear the truth of Christianity and not believe it. You can grow up in a Christian home where the gospel is taught and explained, and you can hear that truth all day long. But it's a whole different thing to actually believe the content of the message and believe that it's actually true. And it's even a whole nother more thing that that truth actually does something within you and it creates a trust in that truth. And so the truth is there in all of these soils. What about agreement? Agreement, again, this is an agreement or belief in the content of the gospel and that you say it's true. You can intellectually know the truth and even believe that it is true without being saved. James 2.19, even the demons know the truth and believe it. They're not saved. We see these first two elements in the rocky soil and the thorns. The truth is present And there is an agreement regarding the truth heard because there is a receiving of it. There is a receiving, and in the thorns there is a carrying of that. We saw that last week. But in both cases, that belief doesn't last. So the first belief is more temporary. It doesn't last very long because that supposed belief didn't withstand the storms. The house was built on sand, not rock. So when trial came because of the gospel, that faith or that belief, that supposed belief, didn't exist or didn't last. It ceased to exist, which showed that there was no true saving faith in the first place. Same with the thorns. There is more longevity, but ultimately that supposed belief didn't reach the proper end goal. 
We saw that in eternal life. They did not reach eternal life. So too many other idols came in and choked out the gospel. Idols of this life, this world that this world throws at you. So the belief in the content was there in both of these soils, but something crucial was missing. Something utterly crucial was missing. So in contrast to these soils, the good soil shows that the content is there. Content of the message is there. The belief and the agreement in that content is there, but shows more. The content of what is proclaimed is heard and understood, as Matthew puts it. The heart takes the message that is preached, hears it, and puts together what is heard with what is preached and understands it. The content of what is proclaimed is heard and accepted, as Mark puts it. The message is received openly with welcoming personal interest. The content of what is proclaimed is heard and retained, as Luke puts it. An individual in their heart holds fast to the message, keeping it secure. But there's more. Those elements are all there, and they were there before, but this good soil shows more. What is missing is the third element of saving faith. Trust. Trust is missing. This is the entrusting of your entire self to the truth and to Jesus. And this will become clear within the context as we go. What helps flesh this out is the description of an ongoing production of fruit. A present ongoing production of fruit. And compared with the thorns, this is a fruit that matures, that reaches the end goal, reaches eternal life. So let's work through this fruit for a minute. This good soil is said to produce a crop. And this crop yields an amount, varying quantities. So what is, what is this talking about? What is this referring to when it talks about fruit? The yielding of this fruit. There's essentially two ways and we can go about this. We can think of this. The quantity reference that is given could either be a reference to fruit like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 or the fruit of the light in Ephesians 5. Truthfulness, righteousness, holiness, faithfulness, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and so on. This is usually the automatic thought whenever we think of truth. Because most of the time when we see the idea of truth, we immediately go to this type of thinking. The fruit of the Spirit type of fruit. Or, this could be referring to the results of evangelizing. That type of fruit. The people that God saves through the Christian's proclamation of the gospel. The sowing of the seed. Which do you think it is? What type of fruit is it? And can we get a clear picture of what this fruit is? And think about the overall context of this parable that we've mentioned before. And we'll get to that to reiterate a, a point here. I think it's the, the results of evangelizing. The people that God saves through the Christian's proclamation, proclamation of the gospel. And I'll tell you why. And I'll give you two main points in, in defending this. So try to follow me here. And we'll do this in, in, before we apply this outworking of this third saving faith element. So what is said at the end of Luke 18, 8, 15? It says, and by persevering, produce a crop. Perseverance itself is a characteristic, a quality. A fruit. The same word, which is the same word as steadfastness or patience, is used in verses like this. James 1.3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 2 Peter 1.5-6. 
For, the very, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness. So the definition of this word is, this word perseverance, is a characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety, godliness, by even the greatest trials and suffering. So the fruit produced cannot mean the fruit of the Spirit type fruit because the use of that same type of fruit is how the fruit is produced. It doesn't make much sense that a fruit like patience would be what's said to be produced when it's already there. You see what I'm saying here? I'll say that again. It doesn't make much sense that a fruit like patience would be what is said to be produced when that fruit is already there. Let's go further into the context, and hopefully we'll, you'll see this clearer. What is said after this parable? When we started looking at this parable, we mentioned this. So listen, Mark 4, 21 through 23 says this. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. And if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Remember this? Jesus tells his disciples that they are to reveal what has been hidden, meaning they are to go to proclaim the message of the kingdom and to do it to anybody and everybody. Why? Because there will be people who have ears to hear who will hear and be saved by God's power. So this has to do with the people that will be saved from their evangelism the production that is yielded from their crop. Other shorter parables following this talk about what the kingdom of like a kingdom of God is, what the kingdom of heaven is like, which describe the harvest, the wheat in the field, the fruit of the kingdom, the multiplication of those who are added to the kingdom because the kingdom starts like a mustard seed and grows into a big tree. So this fruit that is produced is the results of evangelizing. The people that God saves through the Christian's proclamation of the gospel. I'll prove this more as we go and apply this. So how is this the trust that describes the third element of saving faith? It's an example of how the true Christian recognizes that their life is not their own. Their life is not their own. And that there is a mission that is greater than themselves to fulfill. A mission directly given by God. So they give up their entire life for this purpose, for this mission. This mission that hits every single part of their life, their daily life. It's handing over your life and your agenda, knowing that the sovereign God of all creation has chosen you to build his kingdom. And not only to build his kingdom, but to build it through you. You water, you plant, you sow the seed. He brings the growth. This is placing your entire life upon the truth of the gospel which is the message about how God builds his kingdom. This is the gospel driving your motivations, driving your actions, driving your daily life to where you have a desire to look for any and every opportunity you can to say something about Jesus, to develop a genuine conversation with somebody about Jesus. And this trust comes from God working in us first. 
And this fruit comes from God working through us. If God has not worked in you, he will not work through you. So this message, the trust in the gospel itself, has to be in you first. This is where the gospel seed that has been planted in you produces other gospels in other people. It's the production of the same crop, the same fruit. And this is where it gets really good. This is where it it should magnify this, and where you look at this is an amazing truth. This is where the Christians should be emboldened in their mission. This fruit ultimately comes from the seed that is sown within God's people. And this seed is a power of its own. You think of the gospel in those terms? The gospel seed is a power of its own. It's the power of God for salvation. Think about this in terms of these examples from Scripture. This is a familiar one, Hebrews 4.12. This is referring to the gospel itself. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. If you're a Christian, that's what's in you. Colossians 1.6, in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. What's bearing fruit? You and your effort, your exertion to present a, a, a message that's palatable to this world? No, it's the gospel itself within you that's bearing fruit. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, meaning God himself works in and through his gospel message that's in you if you are in Christ. Which means that the actual gospel message is alive and active and it bears fruit. It's not ultimately your effort in evangelism that gets the job done. You are living, thinking, acting. Yes, you are used. But it's God's power working within you and through you to achieve what he has purposed. He graciously uses his people to get the job done and yield a harvest. It's part of God's grace that he even uses us. We don't deserve to be a part of God's building of his kingdom, the God of all creation. You don't deserve that in any way. But yet he's chosen to use his people. Wow. And this is for his glory and for his glory alone, which should be a deep desire of our hearts to see. We should want to see his glory magnified, him magnified, his truth magnified. This also supports what I was saying just a second ago of what type of fruit this is talking about. Because remember the thorns. The gospel itself is to be said to be unfruitful. The gospel itself was said to be. And this ultimately makes the person unfruitful. Hopefully make my point more clear here. Listen further to what John says in 1 John 5. 10 through 12, he says, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Did you hear what he said at the beginning? The Christian has the gospel, the message of God in himself. 
If you are a Christian, then this gospel is in you, and it's alive, and it's active, and it's bearing fruit. It will bear fruit. So here's a mirror to look at yourself. Are you bearing fruit? It's the power of God that yields a harvest. And here's a question to ask yourself. Are you bearing fruit? Who do you recognize that bears, that brings that fruit, that bears that fruit, that ultimately does that? Because you could easily take a burden upon yourself and say, well, I got I to gotta get out there. I got to do this. I gotta, man, I got to figure out what to say. I got a script. I got to do all these things. I got to get yeses. I got to get responses. I got to, it's all on me. It's not all on you. But if we live that like that, we have a huge burden on our backs that I do not want to bear in any way. So this ultimately has to point to God and to his work and what he does in and through his gospel. And this has great implications on what I've said a number of times about the message that is preached. And if it, if it is a false message with God's gospel within produces God's gospel within. A false gospel within does not produce a true gospel within. His gospel within you produces more of his gospel within others when he saves people through your evangelism. And look at the overall parable too. It's about the sower who sows the seed of the gospel in people. And which soil is saved? The good soil. And what is sown in the good soil? The gospel. So the gospel produces the gospel. This is the picture of the fruit that the disciples will see. And this brings us back to the whole point of the parable. This was for the sowers who would sow the gospel in the world. Go out into the whole world and sow this gospel, sow this seed. And they needed discernment as to what was happening within the heart. And the fruit that they would see would be the growth of the church. The growth of Christianity. Wow, we are getting a picture here of Jesus' mission for his people. For his disciples to go out into the world and to preach a gospel that is offensive and foolish. And to know that God works through that message to build his kingdom. To do so perfectly. Added to this is the fact that their perseverance is what produces the fruit. What brings the fruit. It's their perseverance. They were going to go up against major opposition. Major opposition. They were going to have to persevere when their evangelistic efforts looked dismal. And here we see the element of trust again. They were going to have to trust that God actually saves. And he actually does so through his message. That God actually saves perfectly. As they preach the message that is offensive and foolish to the natural man. They had to trust that God is God. And that God has declared that he will save. The ratio of not saved to save in this parable is three to one. It's proof of what they'd be up against. The opposition that they would face in a major way. But notice also how the amount of harvest varies. And we need to touch on this point and do it fairly briefly. Given the fact that it's, gospel, it's God's message within us that is working through us by God's power to save souls, then this quantity is determined by God and not us. The amount of harvest is determined by the Lord of the harvest, not us. 
What this means is that no one is better than someone else because they supposedly led more people to Christ. Make no mistake. God is the one who leads people to himself through you. And those he leads to himself through you will be saved. When God goes to save, he has a perfect batting average. Perfect. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. And this really is, is very complimentary to this whole parable. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Wow. This should magnify what this whole parable is pointed to. And this should kill off any arrogance or pride or comparing we may do with each other. Say, man, I got how many people to respond to Jesus. How about you? Looking down on people in that way. So what does this have to do with you? This has everything to do with you. Because this is a picture of the narrow gate. This whole parable is a picture of the narrow gate. Jesus himself said, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Jesus is that narrow gate. People enter in by him. As life goes, as you live your life, people enter into the kingdom of God by God's power through the gospel. That is how he is determined to bring somebody to Jesus, to saving faith in Jesus. That is a picture of the narrow gate. The truth about God's way of redemption the freedom from sin and the freedom from themselves. Jesus is that truth in his life, death, and resurrection. He is the word of life. And he teaches very clearly what this word of life is. And that's the word of life that's Alive and active and bears fruit within God's people. Jesus is fully God and came to be fully human in order for his people to live. And to live out a reality of what this truth and what this trust that exists in saving faith is. We've seen one main aspect of this today. Evangelism doesn't mean that you have to go sell everything and go to Africa. It's not what evangelism is. It's part of it, for sure. God calls you to proclaim his truth wherever you are in your daily life. Whatever God has called you to do, he's called you to use that in whatever way that you have an opportunity to, to proclaim the gospel to point people to Jesus and to the truth of the gospel should be a way of our life. Now that could place a heavy burden, well, but I'm not outgoing, but I, I'm not very good, but I don't know the gospel that well. I'm not confident in that. Trust me. I've been there. And I am there. I'm a quiet person. We're not going to be perfect in this mission on our account, but God will be perfect in his mission in spite of our weakness. God's message and God's gospel is alive in you, and it will work through you to produce what God wants to produce. 
And a part of that narrow gate, a part of that life, is by God's power, God's gospel lives within his people. And again, it's active. You have to be seeing this point. And hopefully this is bringing your heart to say, what? (laughs) What? The gospel is actually alive in me? It's actually going to produce fruit? Oh my goodness. Wait a minute. I don't know the gospel very well. Maybe I should study. Maybe I should take time with God. Maybe I should ask him to help me, to give me an understanding, because he promises that the spirit of truth does that. Oy. What is this doing within you? What is this driving you to? And this is evidence of trust. A life given over to the cause of God. To his mission. Dying to yourself and your agenda and what you want to do. Because when we truly understand that, we want to deny ourselves. Why? Because we understand what is more greater. The God of all creation is within us and he's planted a seed within us that will grow and that will produce through us. That's a greater mission and a greater agenda that anybody can ever fathom and conjure up their own selves. And if your heart says no, at what I just said, you're not saved. Check your heart. Because you're putting your own agenda first, what you want to do first. Well, I want to do this. Well, I want to do this. You can do that with a genuine affection within your heart that works through that for a greater glory and a greater good and a greater mission. I love skateboarding, snowboarding, artwork, graffiti art, whatever. I love those things. But those things do not control my life, nor they are my agenda anymore. I would like God to use those things for his glory and for the proclamation of his gospel. So those those things aren't aren't idols anymore. They don't control my life. They aren't a focus of my life. They don't bring me happiness. God will use those things to build his kingdom. And that makes them mean that much more gives you that much more meaning to what you actually love and have a passion for. A lot of you are hunters, golfers. Great opportunities, right? Those are pretty relaxed. Going out, enjoying fellowship, enjoying time together. Great opportunities to talk. Going to coffee, doing crochet, whatever you do, right? Whatever you do. Do you have a deep desire to see people come to saving faith in God and in His truth? If there isn't a desire of your heart, if this isn't a desire of your heart and something you consciously work towards fulfilling, then you prove yourself to be at least the thorns where you care too much about you and your life compared to God and his life that he gives through his gospel message that you are to proclaim. This parable is all about building the kingdom of God, the kingdom that God builds. Plus, the fact that he perfectly uses his people to do so. So if you are one used by God to do this, it will show. It will show. Let us pray.